I want to be nearly. So on to the final talk in this session. Um, it's going to be on the complexity of timeline-based planning. OK, thank you. So um, this is a joint work with my advisor, Angelo Montanari, and Martha Chandea Meyer and Andrea Orlandini from Rome. And so <coughs> first of all, what is timeline-based planning? Um, this is um, an approach to, to planning problems that was originally introduced in the context of uh, planning of and scheduling of space operations by this uh, seminal work from Mushetala. And uh, the, um, uh, the difference between timeline-based planning and usual formalisms like strips, like planning formalisms, is that there's, there's no clear separation between actions, states, and goals, um, in the sense that the problems are modeled as systems, complex systems made of some independent components that interact together to, to achieve the goals. And there's no a single executor then acts to, um, to, do, to perform actions uh, and so on. And these, these components are described by state variables uh, that are, and the behavior over time of these state variables uh, is the time are the timelines okay so the timelines describe the evolution over time of the system and the um, the behavior of these timelines is constrained by a set of temporal constraints that describe the model and and the goals and everything so just to um, to have a little example we have these um, two um, components a system with a switch an on on switch and uh, that has to react to the signal Okay. So we want that the, the switch must eventually be turned on sometime after the signal becomes bad, which is the orange signal. So this is the first constraint. The second is similar. We want that the switch uh, turns on no later than 10 time steps after si the signal becomes critical. So uh, the constraint is similar, but we have an hard, an hard deadline constraint of 10 time steps. And then we want that the switch uh, cannot turn off before at least 10 time steps after the signal became good again. Okay, so we want to keep the switch on. And these three constraints can be described. Uh, this is um, a kind of syntax that, that we use, but it's not this syntax for timeline planning. Different systems have different um, syntaxes, etc. But we're using this one. So you can see the three, the three constraints. and uh, the, the, the formula is like this, so uh, each time there's a token, so an interval where x is orange, there exists another one when, where y is blue, such that a uh, starts before the start of b, and here we have the constraint uh, on the distance between the points that can be either unbounded or bounded by some, by some uh, constant bound. Okay, so, so why, why timelines, why timeline-based planning? So the, the advantage of this paradigm um, comes evident when you have to model a domain where there are a lot of interacting components, a lot of uh, um, interaction between, between components, and there's not a single executor that acts. And since you can have flexibility, temporal flexibility on timelines, and uh, the use of uh, resources in flexible ways, so you can model non-deterministic domains very easily and with uncontrollable activities, uncontrollable tasks, um, uncontrollable components, and so on. So this uh, has come useful in a number of planning uh, applications for the space sector, uh, systems by NASA, by ESA, the European Space Agency, and so on. So, th but despite the, all this successful deployment, um, there, there has not been, until recently, a um, thorough theoretical study of the properties of this formalism. So uh, we are focusing on studying uh, this paradigm from a theoretical point of view, concerning with complexity, expressiveness of languages, and we want to compare also this paradigm with PDDL-like languages 
and strips like languages and so on. So this paper focus, uh, focuses on complexity. So what's the computational complexity of this problem? Well, we started from this paper which provides the syntax and not, not only the syntax but also the semantics of the language that I showed you before. And but this, this um, paper provides a very general framework with lots of features, so we had to initially uh, cut down some features. So we're focusing on non-flexible timelines uh, interpreted over a discrete time domain, and we don't, we don't have uncontrollable components, no tasks. So what we say is actually, um, uh, actually two problems, two different problems, because the um, uh, the usual formulation uh, puts um, a bound on the horizon. This is, this is uh, how commonly planning is done. You plan up to a certain uh, horizon. Uh, so this is how the, the systems are usually um, applied. But from a theoretical point of view, there's also an interest in studying the problem where you don't, end up, you don't have a bound on the solution. Okay? So uh, that's because we previously shown in another work that if we remove the, the bound from the, from, uh, from the specification of the problem, you can capture temporal uh, action-based planning languages like PDDL 2.1. So what we, what we've done is to study the complexity of these two variants of the problem. Once when you have an unbounded horizon, uh, that, 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 that's the most general case, and with a bounded horizon, when, uh, which is the, the one most, most similar to, to the applications. So the results is, are this. So the, the first variant is X space complete, and the second is uh, easier, next time complete. Okay, so now I'll show you some ideas behind this complexity results. So the, the core of the wall um, of the wall result is this uh, theorem. Uh, I will not show, uh, show you the detailed proof of this theorem because uh, it's not um, enough succinct to be shown in a, in a presentation, but this is the this is the core of the world reasoning. So uh, it's a small model result. It means that we can bound the size of the solutions. And so if a problem P has a solution, then a solution exists uh, that has length at most doubly exponential in the size of the problem. So we have a double exponential bound on the size of the solution. And this allows us to design an mm, exponential space decision procedure for, the, for this problem. So the, the procedure works um, as follows. We can non-deterministically guess a solution of length at most 2 to the 2 to the 1, the, where n is the size of the problem. So this is a non-deterministic algorithm that runs on a non-deterministic Turing machine. Okay? And once we guess the solution, we just have on a, on a single path of the non-deterministic execution, we have to check that the solution is correct or rejected if it violates some constraint. So we can, the point of all the, the, the algorithm is that we can focus on single uh, windows of exponential size and check the constraints only inside those windows. So we, we start with the guess solution, the, the possible solution, and we slide the, this exponential window along the solution, checking for, um, looking for violated constraints. And the check can be done uh, if, if we have um, an interval that makes some synchronization rule trigger, we can uh, either look for violations inside the window, and this is, uh, um, uh, checking inside the, the, the exponential size window can cover for um, violations of bounded constraints. So constraints like the one before when you have a fixed bound on the maximum distance between the, the predicated objects. And uh, if you have some unbounded constraint to check, you, you would have to check outside, but 
we want to stay inside the window so we just have to uh, do some bookkeeping to remember what we what we've seen and um, to what to remember later what we wanted to see in the future so the point uh, of uh, all the reason is that the number of elements that we need to keep track in this um, to, to check for unbounded constraints is exponential in the size of the problem and this is a result um, not exactly of the theorem but of the technique used in the proofs so the same techniques used in the proof of theorem 1 ensure that uh, we only need exponential space to, to check uh, both the violations inside the window and the violations of unbounded constraints of things happening outside of the window. Okay? So, then uh, we, we are sliding this window through the solution, so we need to count up to mm, this double exponential bound, and this of course requires only an, um, uh, an exponential number of bits to count up to this. So the world procedure runs in uh, non-deterministic exponential space and thanks to this classic um, result in complexity theory we know that this algorithm can actually be run on a deterministic machine, so on a real computer in exponential space. And then this is the exponential space decision decision procedure. Um, the X space hardness comes from our previous work because uh, as I told you we showed that this language is expressive enough to capture uh, temporal PDDL, so the temporal uh, parts of PDDL 2.1 and Rintan in a previous paper showed that this language is X space complete so having this reduction uh, the hardness comes from free so this is the X space completeness of the language with, uh, without bounded horizons. And concerning, concerning the bounded horizon, um, we, we didn't have to, to start from scratch because we can, we can recycle the, the W exponential bound on the, on the solution. But this time, since the, the problem itself provides a bound, um, we actually don't have to guess a solution so long, but we can uh, just uh, guess an exponential size solution because we have this, uh, this number, this bound k, which is provided in the input, and since the number is at most uh, written succinctly in the input uh, in a logarithmic way, in a logarithmic number of bits, um, you, cannot, you will not even be able to specify a bound that is greater than an exponential uh, amount. So we, we can recycle the algorithm that I've shown you before, but this time uh, you only have to um, guess a solution uh, this long. So the, the check inside the window um, can actually be done in not deterministic exponential time, also in the previous case which is uh, exponential space as a, as, a, as, a, as a particular case. So um, the, the wall algorithm here runs in non-deterministic exponential time. And again, the next time hardness is, um, is proved by a simple reduction from this uh, classic uh, problem in complexity theory, which is exponentially bounded corrigan tiling. It means that you have a grid uh, that you have to fill with tiles with different colors, colors on the edges and you have to make sure that the colors match between the edges of adjacent tiles. So this is a perfect problem uh, to match the structure of, time, of these uh, timeline based problems because you have uh, the timelines that makes up the grid horizontally and different timelines makes up the grid vertically. So. Um, this is a pretty easy reduction and actually if you don't want to pass through sorry yeah if you don't want to pass through our previous work to convince yourself of the x space hardness of the general problem without 
uh, bounds, you can also uh, think of a reduction from uh, the same kind of problem uh, without the exponentially bounded uh, horizontal dimension of the grid. And so the, the same proof can be adapted without any change also to show the x space hardness of the most general problem. So to, to wrap up, we studied the complexity of non-flexible timeline-based planning in the form of the language uh, uh, formalized in the, in the paper that I showed you before. And so the general problem without bounds on the horizon is x space complete. The problem with a bounded horizon is next time complete. And um, if you are interested in these things, I suggest you to look at the, at the paper for the full proof of theorem one, because the, the techniques that, that we use, besides some um, not so important combinatorial arguments, are based on a decomposition, a graph decomposition of the solutions of this problem, which um, I, I think is give interesting insight on the structure of the problem that I, I don't have time to uh, to show you now. Um, regarding the future, we are of course looking at the complexity of more, gen more general variants of the problem. So um, adding back flexibility of timelines, which is the most important feature in the world framework, and see what happens to the complexity of the problem when we have uncontrollable components and all of these features, then um, as a um, useful suggestions that I got during the conference, where we will uh, um, soon look at tractable fragments of the problem, so um, to look for easier subvariants of, of the problem that can guide the design of um, useful algorithms for, uh, for, the, for solving uh, tractable subproblems. And then we continue our investigation of expressiveness of, the, of these languages in comparison with other planning algorithms. So this is uh, all, and thank you for listening. OK, any questions? So you mentioned, I think, at the beginning that you assume integer time or discrete. Yeah, discrete, time. yes. Could you say something about where that assumption comes into it? Like, why does that make it simpler and not harder? Like, yes, but um, it, may, it makes simpler, the, the, the proof is made simpler, not, not the problem, probably. But uh, yes, it is, um, this uh, theorem, the proof of this uh, of this bound uh, assu assumes that you can that you can count the the steps between two two events. Uh, actually, it's a combinatorial argument. So if if you have dense time and you can squeeze um, an infinite number of of events on on inside a finite uh, uh, limited uh, interval, the, all this reasoning doesn't apply anymore. That's that's a very general answer, but that's. Uh. Any other questions? So I, I have one. So from Mintanen's work on the complexity of PDVL two point one, um, we got some intuitions about what it is, of the structure of time planning problems that leads to the worst case complexity result. Do you have any insights for timeline based problems? Is there things we can avoid in the language which then have essentially avoid the nasty parts of your complexity results? Or is it the case that any problem we, we write, it might have this complexity and we, we need to identify that? Yes, well, there are actually um, two major sources of uh, complexity in this language. One is, uh, let me go through, okay. Um, one is the, the succinctness of the expression of these bounds. So if you if you don't use um, bounds on these relations and only use unbounded constraints like this, probably the problem is going to be easier. And, and this also happens in, in classic scheduling problems, so it's not, uh, it's not uh, surprising. And then you have this 
um, very flexible syntax in the clauses here. Um, here I show you only a, a, a simple example, but here you don't have to um, quantify only one interval at a time. You can quantify uh, different intervals. And then when you, when you start to, to write complex, um, complex conjunctions of uh, clauses or constraints between different time points of this interval, then you can make some diamond shapes, uh, diamond shaped uh, constraints that uh, in, in, another, in another work uh, we, that we have at Ditchkai next, next month, we show that it's difficult to, uh, to express. So it's another source of complexity. Okay, let's thank Steve again.